In this episode, you're going to learn how game design can help you to deliver better services. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Andy, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 122. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about exploring what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the things that you don't see but that make a huge difference between success and failure? All to help you design services that make a positive impact on people and business. The guest in this episode is Andrea Morales Coto. She's the lead product designer at MongoDB and she has a deep passion for game design. And that's the topic we'll be exploring in this conversation. Somehow game design hasn't been addressed on the show all that often. And that's really curious because when you dig a little bit deeper, there are a lot of similarities between games and services. Think about it. You have actors, you have rules, you have a context, and there's much, much more. So I really encourage you to listen to this episode with a learning mindset because there's a lot you can take away from this. And when you do, I'm sure you'll walk away inspired and thinking how you can apply game dynamics in your work. If you're new to this channel, welcome and I'd love to have you to subscribe. So click that subscribe button and that bell icon to be notified when new videos come out that help you to level up your service design skills. So now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Andrea Morales Cotto. Welcome to the show, Andy. Hey, Mark. How's it going? It's going awesome. I'm really excited for this uh, chat because we're going to touch upon a topic that hasn't been on the service design show that often. I don't know why, but uh, I'm really excited to have a conversation with you about this. For the people who haven't Googled you yet, could you give a brief introduction uh, of who you are? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Andy. It's short for Andrea. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I currently work at MongoDB as a lead designer. Um, but in general, I would say I'm a designer with a strong emphasis on systems thinking and game design. I've been working for the past 11 years. I started off as a director and now I am working in product design. A director as in movie director or? Yes. Yes. I was making short films. Oh, I was wow. making short films and ads. Uh, oh, wow. In Costa Rica. Oh, how cool. Uh, we'd love <laughs> to know more about that in a later episode. Yeah, of course. Um, Andy, we have a 60 second uh, question rapid fire round. Oh, wow. uh, okay. So I'm going to ask you five questions and just reply as quickly as possible. Okay. Okay. Oh, my God. Uh, okay. There we go. What's always in your fridge? Uh, I was going to say peanut butter, but that's not true. Why was I going to say that? I don't refrigerate my peanut butter. Okay. Peanut butter ice cream. Uh, anyway, <laughs> which book are you reading at this moment, if any? Um, Fall uh, by Neil Stephenson. Hmm. Which It's too so long. It's taken me like three months. <laughs> maybe you need the audiobook version. <laughs> yeah, maybe I do. What superpower would you like to have? Um, I want to be like Goku from Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> awesome. What did you want to become as a kid? Or is that the same as the previous one? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely wanted to become Goku or have Pokemon. Um, but what did I want to become as a kid? I, so many things. My first thing, though, was an inventor, which I wasn't even sure what I meant by that. But I was like drawing like little contraptions. I was like, here's a car here's a cool toilet like i was always making up stuff that couldn't be done by inspired by leonardo da vinci <laughs> <laughs> oh that um yeah. and the final question because we have one left and that is i'm curious if you remember the very first mm -hmm. time you heard about service design oh man yeah interesting i don't remember the exact first time but i know for a fact that i read um Oh my God, what's the name? It's a service design book. It's really famous. The black one. Yes. This yes. is service design thinking. This is service design thinking. Thank you. Yes, I read that when I was 24. No, before. That would be when I was 23. Um, I was working in Costa Rica with a person that had come from MIT and knew a lot about interaction design. And 
that's the first time I read it. And I was like, oh, this is brilliant. I didn't know designers were allowed to go into particularly healthcare, which I was really excited mm. about. Um, just like, you know, like these big problems, like healthcare, insurance, all these big systems. And I was like, oh, they're being given the opportunity to do that. Maybe I should do that. Mm. <laughs> um, mm. And yeah, that was the first time. And that book inspired many current service designers. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, you're in a super interesting position because you have a different background than most people who have been on the show. Uh, you work in a different kind of context than most people <laughs> who have been on the show. Right. Um, and we'll be talking about the design discipline that not a lot of people have discussed here on the show. So we're going to uh, sort of investigate and explore how game design and service design overlap, uh, mm -hmm. how they could benefit from each other. Can you um, tell us a little bit about how you became interested and passionate about game design? How did you end up in that scene? Oh, wow. Okay. If if I'm being super honest, I would start when I'm like seven or six years old. So that's a lot. But I would just say games have always been a part of my life. I had, uh, I was going to say the blessing, but I would say the advantage that I was surrounded by parents and friends, uh, particularly male friends that uh, were really open to me playing games with them, uh, which is not the case for a lot of women. And so um games particularly video games but of course board games and you know even tag or, or soccer right uh, or football as we would call it um <laughs> we're all a part of my life right um but i think video games in particular were something that stuck with me um it was something that i thought i wanted to study for a long time um but that wasn't a possibility in costa rica so i was always kind of nurturing that on the side right i was always playing games with my friends i was creating mods for games i remember i created some mods for halo a long time ago <laughs> on my computer um i was playing uh it's so interesting because i don't play those kind of games anymore but i was playing a lot of like counter strike and halo and you know point uh, and shooters yeah. i think yeah. a lot of people listening right now will be like what <laughs> what, what, what uh, games that? where you yeah. shoot things yeah. games where you shoot things um but i was also very passionate about narrative games that were more like some people in this audience might have played it the ones where you would just like solve a mystery you would you know like click on something and then it would show you whether you could see it or take it or smell it or eat it uh, you've probably played those uh, point and click games they were called and those were always a part of my life and so as I was growing up I was trying to get as close as I could to designing them and that meant that I was very involved with reading about the creators with uh, buying game design books I have a bunch of game design books in my bookshelves that uh, you probably can't see right now but I'm happy to get at some point um, and I was just like very passionate about it even before I was passionate about any other type of design Right. <clears throat> I guess you could say that I was also very fascinated by industrial design, but game design seemed like something that I could do really easily. Right. Um, there were and even growing up, um, there were already ways like the Crayola games uh, had like ways of creating mini games in them, which were something that was used a lot in Costa Rica to teach how to, you know, use a computer uh, to children. So, so yeah, they've been there my whole life, but I think I started getting more serious about them when I became like 23, 24, which coincidentally was at the same time that I started getting mm. serious about service design. Um, and that's when I started creating my own games and thinking, okay, how can I use all these things that I've learned and this community that I'm a part of, I have so many game designer friends and apply it in my work. What I uh, also find interesting, and that's awesome to uh, hear that this has been a passion for you basically your entire life, even probably before uh, you knew a thing like game design existed. Um, you're still apparently passionate about this. And when we were sort of preparing this uh, chat, there was also um, like a deeper message in what game design means for you right now, what it can do 
what role mm-hmm. it plays in society, right? Can you tell a little bit about that? Well, I, I think there's two things. One, um, like I said before, games are really hard to access to everyone in society. And I think because of that, <clears throat> a lot of the techniques that exist in game design uh, for creating friendships, avoiding toxicity in communities, creating a community, period, uh, which are things that game design you, you know, particularly now that there's a lot of like online multiplayer games, game design has had to learn how to do that and how to do that effectively, both from a business point of view and a community point of view. Um, but a lot of those like learnings are very um, sheltered. They're very sheltered from the rest of design for many reasons. I think one, because not a lot of women are are in game design um or if they are it's not a very like welcoming space um <clears throat> and i also think that you know for that reason I, there's more that game design can do for design in general but also for society in general um i think games more and more are representing the future of the products that and the services that we're all creating right things that are going to have to be online and offline uh particularly with the pandemic And so I wish we could take more of what we learned there and apply it in our other design experiences because they've kind of already figured it mm. out. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, uh, sort of trying to make some assumptions why we see so little of game design uh, mindset in the service design space. And one of my assumptions is that a lot of the service design methodologies and literature and uh, heritage stems from more of the industrial design uh, heritage and um, game design feels uh, like a different uh, branch of the design discipline, which is, I don't know. um, Do you experience something similar or do you think there's something else going on here that There, I mean, there's so much. <laughs> we haven't found so much overlap yet. I mean, there's so much, right? Like games are still not taken seriously as an art form, right? Whereas, uh, well, slowly but surely, even at MoMA now, now they have uh, the Museum of Modern Arts in New York City. Now they have a uh, games exhibition, uh, which is really cool because it's starting to say like, uh, and props to Paola Antonelli, who's the, the um, curator there where she sees this as an important part of, of the design practice. But that's that's new, right? Before that, MoMA had, first of all, you know, classic art and modern art, uh, mostly modern art. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but also, um, you know, they had Eames chairs, right? Um, there was already a perception of, oh, this is a heightened sensibility of the world, right? This is what design can bring. Not only can it bring usefulness but it can bring beauty and there's something interesting in that whereas like for games first of all games are for children right um and so because of that why would you put something for children at the same level as any other type of design so i think there's the other problem of it's it's hard for certain designers that are in service design or in industrial design which is kind of like the mothership of all design um It, it's kind of, or graphic design as well, it's kind of hard for people to feel like game design is at the same level um, because it implies recognizing something that's made for children. Mm. And I think in general society yeah. does not yeah. encourage that, that. Yeah, and right? that's a notion. Maybe it's not even games, but it's a notion of play, uh, yep. which is which isn't... Play is not serious. Play is not an industry. Play, even though right now it's a bigger industry than... Hollywood, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But in, in the same way, right, you see things like the art departments in film, um, mm-hmm. which I think harkens back to what I do in film. There's a lot of designers in film. There's production design, right? Sure. And you don't see people saying, here's what I learned from production design and I'm applying in service design, which we probably should, but, you know. So um, I can imagine that uh, the people who are listening right now uh might be curious what so what is the potential what is the potential of bringing 
more game design techniques into the space of service design? What do you see as interesting venues? There? Yeah, well, I think there's there's two things that are really huge about games. Um, one, and this was brought on by gamification for a while. I don't know if you remember, there was, I would say, like, 10 years ago, everyone was going wild over gamification. Badges everywhere. <laughs> yeah, badges everywhere, which I despise. But everyone was going wild over gamification because of the promise of these young people that are living their lives online, that are finding new ways of relating to each other online. How can we bring that power and all the things they're doing, like creating whole worlds in Minecraft or in Roblox or whatever, right? How can we bring that? And put it in the real world and in a way uh, entice these people to create things that humanity has never seen before. So I think, you know, that was the original promise. I, I think in general, something that I see more as a promise coming from game design is this possibility of having virtual worlds um, where we can kind of like test and play with um, what society can be, but I, more less from a oh imagine all the amazing things we could do and more hey play is a successful space for people to uh feel more like themselves to be social in different ways to create relationships and i think in that sense game design gives us the space and the learnings because a lot of that has already been learned in some way by those designers um, that we can then apply in in our design lives. And in some way, I think both the playfulness and the, these are the techniques that already exist um, would allow, you know, the design thinking, service design, any sort of design um, to go beyond the constraints of what we think design is now, mm. right? Um, because you're, you're creating for a world that doesn't exist. Right. You're creating whatever you want, basically. Yes, there are, you know, constraints that have to do with how you code things, but I, I think it's just fascinating that we can do that. Um, so instead of doing the opposite, which gamification was like, let's bring that world into reality, I actually think there's a lot that we can learn about how you're creating for the unknown in game design. Um, and you know, young people are used to that now. So so how can we harness that creating for the unknown and, and make something better. Hmm. I would be curious to explore some uh, examples to make the, to maybe make this uh, a little bit more tangible. Also uh, for me, like trying to grasp where the overlap is and uh, where we should be seeking more uh, synergy. So do you have an example? example or a story where you've seen yep. game design techniques applied in a service kind of context? Yeah, um, so I have a couple. The first one is I was working at Consensus uh, before I started working at MongoDB and in there, um, by the way, Consensus is a, is a blockchain startup. It's kind of like a blockchain studio where you have a bunch of little startups inside of it. And Let's not go into the complexities of blockchain because that's already <laughs> difficult um, and there's a lot of hype right now. But I think the most important thing was that my role there as a designer was to think about um, not only, you know, the UX of X digital product, but also when you create a product in blockchain, you're actually creating a little economy. Right. You're creating a little community of people that are exchanging goods with each other or making decisions through economic actions. And so that's huge, right? That means that you have to make sure that this place um, is hospitable and um, exciting for everyone that's involved and that they keep coming back. Because the moment there's no exchanges between people, the product dies. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, it's really a service in a way, right? What you have to do is you have to make sure that people keep coming back and most interestingly, the people themselves are making the the wheels turn, right? So in the same way that if you are designing for a restaurant, you're designing not only for the final person that's eating, you're also designing for, you know, the person that's cooking, right? So the same thing was happening at Consensus. But we had the issue of um, how do you 
uh, start creating an experience that's exciting and playful um, so that people keep coming back um, while um, kind of like predicting what could be uh, the moments where people would get into conflict with each other. Right. Because again, because it's not just about the food that you're putting on the table, but rather if there's no one actually taking care of the restaurant, there's not going to be a restaurant, period. Right. So in this case, it was if there's no one contributing to the economy, there's not going to be an economy. So for me, as as you know, putting on my game design hat, the first thing I did just to give you a very simple example was, well, we need to prototype this um, as if it was a game, giving people different kinds of roles and reasons to come into the game. Um, so there are four different types of players. This is actually very well known research. There are more than four different types of players because sometimes people in game. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> sometimes people in game design don't don't like um, the research that I'm talking about. So there's a lot of polemic, but there's four types of game players. There's um, the people that like to explore, the people that like to socialize, the people that like to achieve things and like earn badges. That's the gamification part of it that people think usually of. Um, and there's the people that just like to see things burn. Uh, the people that like to push the boundaries of your game, the people that like to modify your game, the people that like to um, troll other people in the game. And so when I was thinking about this community that we were creating, my response was, okay, we're going to prototype it and we're going to prototype it from the point of view of giving people roles and seeing, okay, what's going to happen with the person that breaks the game? Um, and we realized pretty quickly uh, that the game was badly designed, that the community was ba badly designed, the community that we were designing, because it was generating this space where if you came in first, like like basically like a pyramid scheme and that's why we changed the design of the community if you came in first and you had money um and you started playing you accrued more money and you accrued more money and you became what was called a whale um and when you became a whale the little shrimp the people that will come in later which are by the way the people that make it fun because they're the ones that bring like novelty to the game um they would just get bored They'd be like, I don't have a reason to be here. I'm not going to make money. I'm not interacting with interesting people. Anything I do doesn't mean anything. And so then they would leave. And that would just leave the whales and the whales would get bored. And we saw this in a half an hour session, mind you, before we even coded anything. Um, and the whales were like, I don't have a reason to be here. This is boring. I don't want to. Why would I be here? This makes no sense. There's no community. I don't want to discuss with anyone. I'm not meeting anyone new. And so to me, it was so easy because I made it into a game to already see this is not going to work. Mm. Lo and behold, that was a, a failed experiment where unfortunately we kept going and we, we coded. And lo and behold, what happened was just that, right? The whales were just like, this is not fun. And then the community died. Um, so that's one really clear case of game design coming in. I knew this as a game designer. I was like, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to prove it to you. And unfortunately, in that moment, I couldn't. Um, but, you know, I, I think it was a really interesting example of how game design already, to me, made it so clear what was going to happen here. Yeah, wow. Uh, and, and I like how you made the parallels with a restaurant um, I'm also thinking uh, my mind these days is a lot in uh, online education and I can totally mm -hmm. see how uh, community and designing for uh, community there plays a big uh, part. I'm, I'm curious, like, what is your take on um, services feeling more goal oriented than, than games and do these those do these two things line up and i'm not even sure if that's really the case like a, a service right. feels more functional transactional goal oriented while a game maybe feels more open uh playful entertaining like how do you see those two concepts lining up yeah 
That's getting a little bit into a uh, polemic <laughs> that exists in game design, which is what is a game? Mm -hmm. um, so you'll get very different ways of interpreting this. Um, uh, there's people that are kind of more utilitarian about it, which is the objective of a game is to uh, win. And so in this case, by winning, it would be solving a challenge or surpassing a challenge uh, in a set of constraints. And, and there's people that think that that legitimately makes for fun. Uh, if you give someone a challenge, you give them a set of constraints, that's fun. So in that case, it's pretty much the same as service design. Um, but then there's the more open one. Mm -hmm. with, sorry, you can go on. You were going to yeah, say yeah, something. Yeah, no, go on. There's the more open and Yeah, and the more open one, I think, is where I've seen a lot of game designers come in, particularly more experimental game designers, right? More indie game designers, where it's more about how do you create um, a suspension of disbelief? How do you create a a moment of emotion? And so I've I, I still remember this designer that I met from from Rare, the the company, the video game company where he was saying to me, the first thing I think of when I start designing a game is how do I want people to feel? He mm, doesn't even mm, start with mm. what do we have? He doesn't start with, uh, you know, what's the business objective? He starts with what is the core emotion that I want people to feel at all times? Which by the way, fits really well with the idea of genres, right? That they have, um, like if you're starting a horror movie, you're like, okay, what type of horror do I want to generate in people? Right. Sorry. You were, and, and I think, um, excuse me. And I think it, that's in that way, very different. Right. Um, but I think a lot can be taken away even in service design for that. Right. Like, um, one, people are expecting more and more of their lives to be experiences. Right. We've talked about this. I know millennials and Gen Z, et cetera, like experiences more than products. Right. Uh, but two, young people are playing so many games, right? I th I think there's um, there's a spectrum, of course, in services. Like when you need to get your train ticket, uh, it it should be like clear, consistent. You should you, there should be very little uh, noise in there and unopenness. But on the other hand, there are of course services that are more experiential, and uh, I can imagine that. Um, having a more open space in there is interesting. I was writing and making notes here, like in service design, like the element that everybody focuses on is the customer journey where you sort of try to plan the entire yeah. narrative. If we go back to movies and theater, while what I find interesting and would love to explore more is in games, you, you, you have games where there is an open world where there is right. sort of a direction, but it's up to the player to come out at the other end in the way that they want to experience this. Yeah. I'm not sure if this would work for a bank or an insurance company, but I can imagine that for <laughs> right. some, for some uh, <laughs> services, a less strict journey a plant journey uh, would be better. Well, you'll notice you'll notice pretty quickly that open world games usually the transactional part, the business part, is at the beginning, um, right? You're buying the open world game at the beginning, unless um, and and to be honest, I haven't played that many open world games that are massively multiplayer, um, just because honestly I don't have the time. But <laughs> uh, I know there's a lot of games like Red Dead Redemption right online that I I think are all about how do we keep people online paying for the monthly subscription? Um, and there might even be microtransactions, which is the moment when you pay for something small in, in the game, right? I know Fortnite certainly does that. Their whole thing is how do I get you to pay for a new skin? How do I get you to pay for new like, and by skin, they mean like, you know, like dresses or hats or new pants, right? Uh, costumes in general. Um, so they certainly have that issue too. Um, but I think the issue is, 
different in the sense that they are already when you come in there's um in in film actually in script writing screenwriting there's um this thing called the intangible contract um at least i learned that in spanish i don't quite know how you say it in english uh, but the intangible contract is a thing that you as a uh audience member and in games they call it the magic circle when you come in, you say, I agree with you, creator, that I'm going to suspend my disbelief. Um, I agree based on the description that you gave me of what we're going to do. And that's magical, no pun intended, because um, that's not something that you do with services. It's something that you do with entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, you say, I'm going to go watch a movie. I'm going to agree that what's happening in the movie is entertaining unless it's not right. And the moment you don't like a movie is when the intangible contract is broken. So say if you're going to see a horror movie and the movie's funny and you didn't expect it to be funny, no one told you it was going to be funny. You say this is a terrible horror movie and you leave. Right. Um, and I think in that sense, games and entertainment in general have a, an upper hand over services, but there's no particular reason, being super honest, that a service shouldn't have that intangible contract, right? Disney does that a lot. Disney is like, the intangible contract is when you go to Disney, you're going to have a magical time with magical beings, blah, blah, blah. So you expect anything done by Disney to be that, right? I think the intangible contract in services uh, has a lot to do with the messaging a company puts out uh, and the brand values. Branding, right. Exactly. And that's the uh, that's uh, that's what you tend to expect when you engage with a service provider. And unfortunately, too often they aren't able to live up to that. And there's uh, a lot of frustration and anger and uh, painful moments there. Well, yes, and I would say there is one thing that games also have that services could perhaps do. Although, of course, like I said, because they're such different, you know, like beasts, uh, <laughs> there have to be like a process of, of testing this. But I think there's something interesting about how in games, the going into the circle is uh, the magic circle is slower, right? So you have, yes, you have like the branding of like the trailer or the box, right? Where the board game comes in. But the first thing you do in games is you read the instructions. You choose which role you want to choose. You get to choose a little, like um, if it's a board game, you choose the little um, figurine that you're going to be, right? You build your character. And I think that is a part of the magic circle that you don't have as much in services or it becomes more of the physical space, right? So when you first walk into the bank, how much space is there? How how welcome do you feel, right? Um, so there there are some parallels, but I think games have the, the added uh, like oomph of the fact that people come in expecting to be entertained, mm. Mm. right? Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah. You... Uh... You mentioned also something that in your current role at a company that creates a database, uh, basically, you're using a method around loops and yes. cyclical design. It, yes, right? cyclical what? progression, cyclical design. Yeah. Sounds complicated. What is that about? Yeah. Uh, and I would recommend anyone that wants to read more about it, uh, you can go to a thing called Project Horseshoe, which is a, a, a group of game designers get, that get together every day, uh, excuse me, every year, I wish every day, every year to create these amazing reports on what they think are the biggest problems in game design. One of them is how do you create loops? So loops are a, a, a very uh, basic concept in game design, particularly in open world design. Um, where the idea is not so much how do you get people to go from level zero to level 100, but rather how do you um, keep people coming back by doing an action that creates uh, some sort of side effect that is satisfactory right, to them, and then they want to keep coming back and they want to find something new in, in, the, in the loop. So, what, so can you give an example? Yes, of course. So... Uh, I'll give you a very simple one. 
Um, in games, when you go and buy things in a store, because there are stores in the games, um, say, for example, this is, I, I don't necessarily like games that have weapons, but I think this is the easiest way. Uh, you're going to go and you're going to upgrade your weapon, mm -hmm. right? So you go to the stall where the weapons maker is, because there's always one. Um, and this becomes a loop that you do again and again and again. But each time you come in, there might be different weapons, depending on what you did. Or the stall person might talk to you differently according to what you buy. So there's not a lot that's really changing there. Uh, but it's enough for you to say, that's interesting. I wonder what I'm going to come up with this time. I wonder if I'm going to get better weapons. I'm going to wonder if he's going to say different things. I wonder. There's this element of expectation. Sounds um, like a swap machine. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, but it always has to be driven by what you do. So there's this game, Hades. Um, and I can talk about how I did this in MongoDB, but there's this game, Hades, um, which is all about, it's called roguelike, which means that um, you're fighting a bunch of monsters really quickly. Um, but the, the trick is that every time you die, you have to start from the beginning again, which is incredibly frustrating. So how do you make that loop interesting? And they made it so that every time you play, according to what happened in play, the characters that can talk to you when you're like reborn, uh, you're a god, uh, when you're reborn, they have different things to say to you according to how you played and according to how you've talked to other people. So there's this loop where, yes, you're getting better because you are. There's mastery and there's different types of loops, right? You can have loops around mastery. You can have loops around exploration. You can have different types of loops. But what they do is they mix the basic core loop, which is a mastery one, and they add, hey, you're going to learn different things about people. And so if you're a player that just wants to have the achievements, you're going to do the achievement loop. Right? You're just going to get better and better and better. You're not going to talk to anyone. You finish the game. Great, you did it. If you're the kind of player that wants to learn about other people and about what's happening in the story, the loops are earning you that. So you're going to keep coming because you want to know how this ends. You want to know what happens to these players. I, I mean, to these characters. And how yeah. does yeah yeah? And how does the how does this translate into a service context? Yeah. So I think. <clears throat> Many times, well, first of all, if your your user or or the person that's going to be coming to your service again and again and again is going to be coming again and again and again, you have to generate a way for them to feel like that loop is satisfying, right? So, for ex for example, in the case of MongoDB, yes, we have a product which I see more as a service um, where the user is coming in, the user is a developer, um, uh, uh, an app developer. They come in, uh, they're going to try it for the first time. They might have what we call the aha moment, right? The the magic moment where they figure out, oh, what this is what this product does. But then they're going to keep coming because they're going to use us to develop their app again and again and again. So how do I make sure that I offer them in each loop uh, a way to become better masters of what's in the, in the service, what's in the product, right? So I'm giving them ways for novices to do things and mm. heating kind of like mm -hmm. Easter eggs for experts, right? So I've been giving them that delight by saying like, hey, guess what? You can use these hotkeys to do the thing that you did when you were a novice five times as faster. Or, hey, guess what? If you get an error, you're going to get this really delightful little piece of information that no one else would know, mm. right? So it's this idea of, can we give you these loops uh, in a way that's a little bit more delightful? Mm. And I'm thinking, like, uh, what kind of services are there where you are coming back over and over where you actually want to uh, learn stuff? Maybe it's not with the... Uh, company providing the electricity at your house. But for instance, a restaurant, we've had a conversation here on the show um, with somebody from Japan. And he said, there are restaurants in Japan who make the menu so difficult that as a first time user, you're intimidated and they actually don't want you to be asking questions. Like right. it, it, the, the menu and the restaurant experience is actually in a way challenging you to become a better 
user of that right. restaurant. Like the, the chef is is at that level and he, he only right. wants people who are at the same uh, level. So level as him. Yeah. So making Perfect. that experience actually challenging <laughs> yeah. of ordering the food, like you get a menu that you don't understand and then you have to build that mastery. I can see those uh, dynamics at play in different service environments as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I also think it reminds me of In and Out Burger, where they have a hidden menu mm. that you can only know if friends have told you. So you can ask for for things that they don't have on the menu, but only if someone has told you, or you've looked it up online at this sure. point. But yeah. And and now I I sort of get. Uh, the sense that, okay, this might be a moment where people say, ah, but that's just silly. That's the playfulness uh, thing. This is like, this isn't serious. Uh, what's your response to that? That's okay. Yeah. It is. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I, I mean, to me, it uh, if it's not playful, what are we here for, right? Um, a lot of creation comes from play. Mm. And I think a lot of designers don't consider what they do play, but what they do is play. They put it's like when you're given when you're given a blank piece of paper and you're not given any constraints. People go, Oh, this is really hard. I can't do it. I need constraints. Literally, that's the definition of a game. Mm. Mm. Right? You're being you're surpassing an obstacle with a set of constraints. So you're playing. So whether you like it or not, you are playing. And I I think the less play you do, the more you're going to be um, kind of like broken away from the way society is evolving, which is towards embracing play, not only escapism, but as a way of creation, mm. you know? And I think uh, it's, it's just good for business, even. Like if those are your business objectives, like having a hidden menu, creates loyalty it probably attracts uh more customers in a certain way um it it uh provides more pleasure for your customers so i can totally see how it's just a very practical way of doing business and a smart way of doing business it's also an earnest way of doing business um and by this i mean embracing playfulness um implies that you accept uh that not everything you do is that serious mm. um and i think there's something really powerful in that because it leads to people seeing that in your brand and and accepting your brand more earnestly you know um i i noticed this like even with in and out it, it's so funny to me um but for them to say like we have a hidden menu um, it's completely useless at this point. It's on the internet. You know what I mean? If you really wanted to, you'll just go online. But there's something about having their users tell the new person. And, and this was actually the person that brought me to In-N-Out was a game designer. And they were like, we're going to In-N-Out. And I was like, okay, I've never been because I, I had never, uh, I had been to California, but had never had it. And he was like, we're going to In-N-Out. And you're having the secret menu. And I was like, the what? And he was like, the secret menu. We're ordering something from the secret menu, which, by the way, is more expensive, I believe. Um, good for business. Yeah. <laughs> good for business. Um, and so there was something about it that I immediately, I don't I don't think I would eat a lot of In-N-Out Burger because um, I'm usually vegan. I'm not very strict about it, but I'm usually vegan. But it was just like the fun of it. I can't forget about it, you mm. know, and I'll probably tell my friends, have the In-N-Out secret menu because it will make me feel like I'm in on the secret, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's doing the job of getting people to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And there are, I, I, I really feel that we're scratching the surface of what's possible in this overlap and how, how these two um, game design fields uh, could uh, sort of strengthen each other. What would you say to people who want to take the first step into applying more game design techniques in a service context? Yeah, I'd say uh, go play games. That would be the first one. Start with the thing that is the least um, 
embarrassing because you will feel embarrassed at the beginning. That's what games are about, about like you feeling like you're not yourself and that can be embarrassing, right? So the first thing I would do is if you haven't played games in a while, go play games. You'll find something for you. It doesn't have to be the shooter game. It can be something else. It can be board games. It can be live action role playing games, which I love. That That's really if you feel no shame at all. Uh, but it can be live action role playing games. Start with playing games and then slowly but surely you'll start meeting people that design games. It's really hard to find people that play games that don't also design them. Immediately, people want to be a part of it. So as you start meeting people that design games, you'll get to know how to do it yourself. And there's a lot of ways to do that. There's a lot of books that I could tell you about um, that relate to the design of games. But I think the most interesting part is using tools online that allow you to make games. Um, so you can make board games through Board Game Simulator if you don't want to make them physically. I would say if you're more like me, the kind of person that wants to make physical games, make physical games, mm. you know, you don't even need to modify tag and play with people and see how it goes. Right? Is there, it, is there a course that you know of called game design for services? <laughs> no, I wish, mm. I wish there is not. <laughs> I know there's a space there. Um, I think I know someone doing game design thinking. Hmm. But I don't remember when I remember seeing it on like LinkedIn. But no, hmm. no one has done that. There's usually not that much of an overlap. If somebody is um, inter interested in and in exploring this topic, game design for services, reach out to me on LinkedIn or something like that. <laughs> I'd be really yeah. curious to see where where that goes. So heading towards the end of our chat, I'm really curious if you look back on your very long uh, game design career. What are some of the big lessons that you learned along the way that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I, I you know, I think the first one is that <clears throat> when you're starting to apply these things in other design spaces, in services or in products, people will have a hard time accepting game design techniques at the beginning, and you kind of have to shelter those people and perhaps not even tell them that they're game design. Um, Again, because I think game design is not taken seriously, right? Or or what is this game for? It, 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 we don't want people to play things, right? So the first step is just saying, you know what? I'm just gonna do prototyping, paper prototyping. And in reality, what you're doing is making the service into a game and playing it out with people, just to give you an example. Um, or the opposite can happen where they're super hyped about gamification and they just want to put like badges and points on everything. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not what game design is. Um, <laughs> a lot of games don't even have points. This is not what it's about. Um, so I think in that case, um, I've had the issue of kind of like bringing people back and saying like, no, not everything needs to be a game, but you can still use game design techniques in it. like the loop design idea, right? Um, and I think the last thing for me would be that the best way, like I said before, to start knowing when to use game design techniques or when to intervene with game design um, is to make games. Um, I know that's really stressful at times for people that are new, but you can start with, I'm going to make a new version of football. This time... The person that wins is not the person that gets the ball in the net, but the person that hits the goal post the mm -hmm. most amount of times. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the smallest thing, but with that, you'll start getting a feel for what are rules, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what mm -hmm. are roles, what are mechanics, right? And so once you get that feel, you'll start applying that elsewhere. We didn't even touch upon that, like the overlap between having... Uh rules a context in which things happen and a service you have a service context and games you have the game context well, there's so much to explore there how would you summarize our last 45 minutes oh my god i think game design um is a rich design area that has dealt with many of the hairiest design problems that we deal with in services and products. And 
it would be really beneficial to us, to all of us designers, if we took a look into what they're doing and adapted into our practice. Um, yeah, I think that would be that would be it. There's a lot. If anything, it'll give you words for what you're designing, right? Like the concept of cyclical progression and loops or the concept of mechanics and rules or asking yourself who wins here? Mm -hmm. What is winning mm -hmm. in my service, right? Which is another way of saying what is the user here for, but it's slightly different, right? It's not positioning as a job to be done. It's positioning in, in the context of other people as well, right? Like. So, yeah, 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 super interesting. A few episodes ago, we had Brian Run uh, Ryan Ramsey on the show, and we talked about business design. And, and one of the concepts that came up there was just dig into the uh, business world and learn the vocabulary, so you'll know what to Google the next time. And I think it's similar to this, like just start exploring game design, so you'll know what to Google the next time. And uh, that's already uh, a very that's good already. Step way more than you would currently have, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And they, uh, like, yeah. yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> well, I can imagine that some people would be interested to sort of follow your work or reach out and ha ask some questions. What are the best ways to do that? Yeah, sure. Um, so for those that speak Spanish, this will be easy to follow. But my, my Twitter is Menta Purpura, which is M-E-N-T-A-P-U-R-P-U-R-A. That's the, the links are hard. in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can follow me on Twitter or thank you for the links. Um, you can also just look me up on my website, andreamoralescoto.com, and you'll see everything that you need to see there. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Andy. Uh, again, I sort of feel that we scratch the surface, but I hope we got people curious and excited to sort of do their own research and uh, yeah, see where this goes. Yeah, hopefully. I The more people want this, please come to me. Please reach out. I'm super happy to talk about game design or put you in touch with game designers that have dealt with the same problems that you're dealing with. So what's your biggest takeaway from this conversation with Andy? Leave a comment down below. And as you've made it all the way here, I assume that you enjoy conversations like this. So if you haven't done so already, click that subscribe button because we bring a new episode like this every two weeks. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.